Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. One of the hard truths of the gospel is that the Christian life is not always going to be easy. In fact, it might be quite hard. And yet God strengthens his people with his grace to endure whatever he sets before them. And today in our study in Acts 14, we'll see God's strengthening grace in the life of Paul and Barnabas. Well, hello again, and I'm Russ Brewer, and you are listening to our daily podcast is going through each of the key chapters of the Bible, one per day, and just seeing how the message of God unfolds throughout his scriptures. Today, we're in Acts chapter 14. Now, yesterday, we were in Acts chapter 13, and that began Paul's first missionary journey that went from the city of Antioch over to the island of Cyprus, and then up to the interior of modern-day Turkey. Now, we left off at the end of chapter 13 with Paul and Barnabas in the city of Pisidian, Antioch, and, and much of Acts 13 records Paul's message of those people. And so Acts 13 told us that the Jews and Gentiles were listening to Paul's message, and at first the people were eager to hear what Paul had to say, but then the opposition kicked into high gear and Paul and Barnabas were forced to leave. And yet their ministry still bore fruit, and Acts 13.48 says that as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. And so there was much joy going on in Pisidian Antioch, even as there was much anger at Paul and Barnabas for bringing the gospel to them. Now, we're only about halfway through this first missionary journey. Now we come to chapter 14. Chapter 14 opens with Paul and Barnabas coming to the city called Iconium, which is located in the central region of modern-day Turkey. Iconium was a prominent city in that region. It would have been part of the region known as Galatia, And this would be the region that Paul was writing the letter of Galatians to. In fact, many scholars would say that Galatians is the first letter that Paul wrote, and it was written to this region somewhere around the end of this chapter and before the main events of chapter 15. Not all scholars believe that, but a lot do. And so, verse 1 tells us, Paul and Barnabas arrive in Iconium, and they go into the synagogue, and they spoke the same message that they've been saying in every city they've gone through so far. And just like in the past, they start with the Jewish people to announce to them that their long-awaited king has arrived. And like when they were in Pisidian Antioch, at first lots of people heard this and they believed both Jewish and Greek people. And then also like in the past, once Paul and Barnabas started getting a little bit of traction with their message, the unbelieving Jews rose up and began to oppose them. And yet here we see in verse 3 that Paul and Barnabas don't back down. They're being strengthened by the Lord. They're relying upon him and they were testifying of his grace and he was confirming their message with signs and wonders. And yet, with all of this exciting stuff going on, amazingly, verse 4 tells us that the people were divided and, and, and things got so bad. There, there were some people who were making plans to stone Paul and Barnabas. And so in verse 6, the apostles leave Iconium and they go off to Lystra and Derby, and they continue to preach the gospel. Now, at some point after they arrive in Lystra, they come to a man who has been unable to walk for his entire life. And it seems as though Paul is just out there just proclaiming the message and he's telling people about the Lord and this man's listening. And so Paul can see that he's got this faith to be made well. And so Paul says to him, stand up. And amazingly, the man leaps up and the crowd's just amazed. And they start saying, Zeus and Hermes have visited us. Now, why are they saying that Zeus and Hermes have visited them? Well, there's actually a very specific reason for that. The Roman poet Ovid recorded a legend that said that once upon a time, Zeus and Hermes had visited the region. They came dressed as lowly vagabonds seeking food and lodging, that they had gone throughout the town, just knocking on doors, and they were turned away from every home. And the last house they came to was the poorest of them all, and the elderly couple that was in that home welcomed them in, gave them a banquet from their meager resources, and in appreciation, the gods transformed their home into a temple and destroyed everyone else of the flood. And so in Acts 14, the people see Paul and Barnabas dressed kind of like vagabonds, but doing these miracles, and they believe that somehow Zeus and Hermes must be back again, and they don't want to make the same mistake they did last time and be destroyed by a flood, so now they're here to worship the apostles. While at this, Paul and Barnabas cry out saying, no, 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 we're calling you to turn away from these vain things to the living God. But even in saying this in verse 18, the people still wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But then comes verse 19. Acts 14, 19 says, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Well, this is a change of events. In one minute, people are trying to worship these guys. The next minute, they're trying to kill them. And they stoned the apostles so bad that they figured Paul was dead. And they just kind of dragged him out of the city, probably just kind of leaving him out there, maybe to be eaten by scavengers. 
But miraculously, in verse 20, when the disciples stood around him, he got back up and he went back into Lystra and he spent the night there. And the next day he goes off to Derby. Now, verse 21 tells us that in Derby they had success with the gospel and many people became disciples. And then at that point, the forward progress of this first missionary journey just comes to an end here in Derby. The apostles have gone far enough, now they're going to turn back and head towards Antioch again. And so they go back to Lystra, where Paul was practically stoned to death, and then on to Iconium and then onward to Antioch. If you have your Bibles open, if you look at verse 22, notice the shift in their ministry. Their first ministry undertakings as they're going through these towns is just to win people to Christ. Now they're going back through and there's already some believers in each of these towns. This next undertaking is to strengthen the souls of these disciples and encourage them to continue in the faith. Now, when verse 22 says they were strengthening them to continue in the faith, what does that mean? Well, since it's likely that the book of Galatians was written around this time, Galatians gives us a window into the kinds of things that Paul and Barnabas would be telling these people, the things they needed to hear. Just going back to kind of like a quick overview of the book of Galatians, they would have needed to know the nature of the gospel of grace, that we are saved by grace and that we live by grace and that God's grace strengthens us. And that grace doesn't come through the law, but it comes through fellowship with his spirit. You've got all this Jewish opposition going on. And they would need to recognize that the purpose of the Mosaic law has been now completed in Christ. It was to lead them to Christ. And now that they have come to Christ, its role has been fulfilled in their life. And now at this point, their walk with the Lord is through walking by the Spirit. And you know you're walking with the Spirit when you're demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, against which things there is no law. And you know, when you think about the book of Galatians, it really is tied to this whole section here. So if you would want to even just kind of pause and, and skim the book of Galatians, I think this message becomes that much more powerful when we understand it in light of what's going on here in Acts 14, where Paul is facing constant opposition from these Jewish folks who are calling everyone to still keep the Mosaic law. And he's like, guys, no, no, no. We are saved by grace. We live by grace. And that's just the theme throughout the book of Galatians. Well, going on in our study here in Acts 14, if we look at Acts 14, verse 22, again, where Paul's on this return trip, verse 22 also says that they were strengthening the souls of the people and they were teaching them through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, this might seem like an obvious point because these people have seen the hostile opposition to Paul's message and how people try to kill Paul and Barnabas and, and both Iconium and Lystra. And these people could see that walking with Christ is no cakewalk. There are times it's going to be like walking through tribulation. Well, going on to verse 23, verse 23 says, When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so Paul and Barnabas also leave these churches and appoint elders in them. These elders here, their role was to continue to shepherd the people in God's truth. And it's amazing that here we are so early in the expansion of the gospel, and we're already seeing the structure of the church taking shape. We'll come back to elders in a moment as we finish out to chapter 14. The last handful of verses talks about their journey back to Antioch. Along the way, they stop in Perga. You might remember from yesterday's podcast that Perga was the city where John Mark left Paul and Barnabas, and it seemed like there was no ministry being done there. Now here in verse 25, Paul at least proclaims the gospel to them. But again, there is no record of it bearing fruit there. And this is the last time that Perga is mentioned in the Bible. Just kind of an interesting little thing going on there. Well, from Perga, they sail back to Antioch, and their first missionary journey comes to a close. In verse 27, they gather the people together. They celebrate all that God had done with them and how he'd opened doors of faith with the Gentiles. And verse 20 says they spent a long time there. And, and that then brings us to chapter 15, but we're still here in chapter 14. So let's highlight a few things from this chapter here. First, going back to verse 22, when Paul says to them, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Let's just point out the focus of their message. Their message wasn't about all of the great things they'd enjoy if they became followers of Christ. It was about the tribulations they'd be taking on if they did. These people are going to be suffering the same kind of persecution at the hands of these hostile Jews and the pagan worshipers, just like Paul and Barnabas did. The same townspeople who tried to kill Paul and Barnabas would likely try to kill these new believers too. The Christian life is not meant to be easy. And Jesus calls us to pick up our cross and follow him. Not because the cross is a beautiful piece of jewelry, but because the cross is a gruesome tool upon which the world will try to crucify us. Now, also, notice the focus of this message is on the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas were telling all these people that Jesus is king, and he's calling them to repent and submit to this king. 
That's the biblical focus of the gospel. Jesus as our God and King, he is going to establish a kingdom and he's offering anyone and everyone the opportunity to be a part of it when he returns. These days, the typical gospel message focuses on our well-being and how we could have a better marriage or more peace in life if we just would come to Christ. And yet the focus of the Bible is on the kingdom of God. And we see that all the way back here in Acts 13 and 14. And this underscores the point that the church has always been an organization with a specific mandate. Our king has given us the mandate to bring the message of his kingdom and the invitation to be part of it to the world. And when the church gets away from that as its mission, the message will inherently become about self and, and how to improve life here and now. And while the gospel does improve life, the message of the gospel is an invitation to be a part of God's kingdom. And when a church does not hold that message, it will just quickly become about the here and now, and this message will increasingly sound like the self-help fluff that is being offered by the world. Well, as we keep on thinking about this passage, this passage also shows us how the message of the kingdom is constantly under attack from Satan, and we see his attempts to thwart the preaching of the kingdom here in Acts 14. The people of Iconium were opposed to the message and wanted to kill Paul and Barnabas. The people of Lystra swung to their side and wanted to worship him. Neither one was okay, and then the Lystra people wanted to kill them as well anyway. All of this is just the outworking of Jesus' instruction in Matthew 13, 19, where the evil one seeks to undermine the preaching of the kingdom. The enemy's undermining work here in Acts 14 is to distort the truth and mock its message, oppose its implications, and confuse its teachings. And you see all of that just working itself out here in Acts 14 as Satan is opposed to the preaching of the kingdom. Okay, so a couple more thoughts about this chapter here. We also see in chapter 14 this, this focus on church leadership being that of elders. And this is just astounding when we think about the change from the Old Testament Judaism to New Testament Christianity. In the Old Testament, the religious leaders were the priests. In the New Testament, the religious leaders are not priests, they're elders. We know from Titus 1.9 that elders need to hold fast to the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute with those who contradict. And I find it amazing that if a man will simply accept what God says about the kingdom and our responsibility to live in light of it, it may not take long. I mean, we think about just the time frame of Acts 13, 14, we're talking about months, not years. And it may not take that long for a man to be ready to step into that role of an elder. Now, 1 Timothy 3, 6 says he must not be a new convert, but when the church is entirely new, like, like with it, when everyone's new, like in Titus's ministry, we're going to see God raise up elders who fit the biblical qualifications. And these are men who will embrace this message of the kingdom and shepherd the people to live in light of it. Finally, Acts 14 shows us the danger of fickle crowds. Now, these people literally went from worshiping Paul and Barnabas to trying to kill them. And in trying to kill them, they actually thought they succeeded when they stoned Paul. Often, when God's servants are faithful with his message, they might face a fickleness of the people in their response to the preaching of the word of God. More than one pastor has been dragged out to the trash heap and left for dead. And yet when a man is faithful, he will often find the Lord will strengthen him and he'll be able to stand up and go back to the very people who sought his destruction. It's often said that courage is not running the battle the first time, it's running the battle the second time knowing what you're getting into. I've seen many of Christ's servants get beat up, but stay the course and see God's redemptive grace in that very community that was so hostile to him. And so if there are any pastors or missionaries who are listening to this podcast, uh, let me just say, well, we've submitted to a calling from God where by and large, the more faithful we are, the less people will like us. And, and, and while that's not an excuse for incompetence, Paul's words to the churches are for us today as well, that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. But when we're doing his work, his way, he will provide us with the strength and grace we need to keep pressing on. Well, we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.